um, breeding and genetics, and this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I am a reproductive physiologist by training, a cattle breeder, and I love genetics. Um, when I used to work in the dairy industry, I had the Red Book memorized, and only Holstein people will appreciate that. But um, now I'm in the beef business, and I do a lot of uh, work both personally and professionally with genetics. So we're going to go ahead and get started. You can ask questions in the chat um, when, we're get, when we get to the end of the program. Um, I'll take those questions and we'll also um, be happy to let you unmute if you like at the end and, and ask a question um, as it goes. So I tell, always like to tell people about this picture. This is a, uh, one of the farms we rent and uh, that's just a calf. It's a, um, but the real thing I want people to notice is what we deal with in Washington County when it comes to pasture and farming and that's limestone. Um, it's fun and makes things interesting. What happened here? Let me get my slide to advance. If you there we go. There you go. All right, so there we go. All right, so um, tonight we're, we're gonna talk about breeding and genetics. Um, everyone, I hope, has breeding goals um, when it comes to that. And we're gonna, we're gonna let you think about those as we go through the program, hopefully, um, you have some idea what your goals are, but I'm going to talk about some subsets of goals that you may or may not have. Um, we're going to talk about selection tools. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the cow side of the equation, and then we're going to talk about bulls. Uh, bulls get a lot of press, um, and we'll talk about those because of basically the bull is half your herd's genetics. Um, obviously, if you have more than 25 cows, you have more than one bull, but anyway, we're just going to go that direction. Um, you'll notice there that little uh, calf uh, in front of her mother. Uh, she was born the other morning on a frosty morning, Monday morning. Uh, we've had a run of bulls this year. She's one of the few heifers. We've had three um, out of uh, 16, 17, uh, 16 calves that have been born on that farm. Uh, but that is a, a, a testament to what we um, strive for in our breeding. Uh, Every one of those heifers has, has calved unassisted. And that's certainly a, a, a requirement of our management system anyway. So some of your breeding goals, um, some of you may be looking at maternal traits. Uh, some of you may be looking at growth. Uh, some of you may be looking at a terminal cross. Um, a lot of the, the folks out there in the academic world and, and other places think that 85% of the cattle cow calf operations in the United States ought to be a terminal cross um, operation and uh, somebody else ought to make their heifers. I completely agree with the terminal, but I don't trust anybody to make my heifers. So I'm more of a balanced approach and there are folks out there that do it. Uh, more of a balanced looking at both maternal and, and growth a little bit. And ultimately we do this so we can increase profitability. So we're gonna talk about genetics first, and then we're gonna talk about some uh, other things that, on the back end of this. So um, EPDs are what we use to measure genetics in the beef cattle industry. Um, it's called expected progeny differences. I'll probably use EPD the rest of the evening. Uh, um, I have a picture there of, of a bull named Penn State Power Play. Uh, he is the still to this day, the um, ideal uh, Angus bull. Uh, and that bull is old, um, uh, he's dead, but uh, if he were alive, um, he would certainly be drawing social security. Um, so how do we get the EPDs and what do they mean? Um, they've been applied to, you're, you're applying them to approve the genetics. Uh, we've been using them for over four decades now. Uh, the prediction, they predict transmitting ability of a parent to its offspring. Uh, certainly when we made a cow to a bull, we're getting 50% of the genes from each one. Uh, and so we're trying to, to predict what that resulting calf is going to do. And we um, use these to make selection decisions for traits desired in a herd. If you go back to the previous slide, are we looking for maternal traits? Are we looking for carcass traits? Or are we looking for a balance? Again, for a given trait, EPD values are calculated based on data submitted by producers to breed associations. That's very important to understand. Um, we'll talk about the DNA and genomics in a little bit, 
but a lot of this data early on, especially, and a lot of the historical data that it was derived from uh, producers turning in data to breed associations. So purebred producers would send in at the end of um, calving, maybe they'd send in all their birth weights, they would send in their, how difficult the calvings were and so on and so forth. And they would, of course, the offspring would be sire and dam identified. That's very important. Uh, now we can take a snippet of, of uh, flesh, do a DNA analysis, and we can make it a little bit more um, accurate uh, from that perspective. So here's, um, you'll see sometimes if you see uh, EPDs um, out in the popular press or in sire catalogs or whatever, you'll see a sometimes a G dash EPD. So that's a genomic evaluation as well as data. Um, and so that makes, again, like I said, it's going to make your uh, reliability of that data uh, more uh, robust than what you might otherwise find. Um, accuracy. So again, if you buy a, a yearling bull, uh, there's not much accuracy. If you use a uh, um, semen from a, a, a yearling bull you're, or a young bull, you're getting, again, a low accuracy. Uh, with, gen with genomics now, we can bring that accuracy up. Um, it's not quite um, the same as being proven, but it's certainly a lot better than what we have. And we're the more data we get, the more reliable those genomic um, that genomic data becomes as our predictors are we're able to refine. The other thing to remember is there is a population based value. So if you're a Hereford breeder, um, you have a population a Hereford population based value. And over time, breed associations adjust those accordingly. We're not measuring against a Hereford that was born in the 1980s. We're measuring against the Hereford that was born more recently. Um, and I don't, I'm not a Hereford guy, so I don't know where they're at uh, are in that. But Angus just did a, about two years ago, just did a, a base adjustment. And so numbers did change. Animals didn't change, genetics didn't change, but our, our uh, base changed. Uh, producers should define their specific um, production goals first and then select based on EPDs that allow you to uh, get closer to meeting those production goals. Again, you might be selling calves at weaning, so you're going to um, prioritize EPDs differently than a person that's retaining heifers or a producer that's wishing to retain ownership through the feedlot. Uh, again, that's going to be a very different selection criteria based on what your ultimate goals are. Uh, it's, it's important to remember most of us here in the East for sure, because our herds are not great big. Um, we're probably somewhere in that selling uh, calves at weaning and retaining a few heifers. There are some folks that do feed their own cattle or do retain ownership through the feedlot. Um, I would love to get carcass data on my cattle. Um, but until uh, everyone tells me, uh, until I get a trailer load, it's probably not going to happen. So for feeder calf producers, we're going to look at EPDs for birth weight. Um, we're going to look for calving ease, both calving ease direct and calving ease um, for the actual calf that's going to be coming out of that bull. Uh, and that's what it means when it comes to calving ease or calving ease direct. That's going to be different, that's a different term for the same trait based on uh, the different breed associations. Then we're going to look at weaning weight because we're selling pounds of calf at the end of the, the season and yearling weight's an indicator of that growth as well. If we're looking at maternal selection, again, some of these are uh, interchangeable depending on your breed association and some of them aren't. But we're looking at calving ease, again, a maternal now. We're looking at how easy the, the, does this sire's daughter calve. We're looking at milk production, which again is a growth. Uh, you know, how many pounds of milk can this cow produce to make this calf grow? Uh, some use total maternal. Uh, some breed associations use mature weight. Uh, looking at, again, if you're trying, 
with the with the emphasis if you're going to go to the next slide or our next criteria about terminal or growth uh, mature weight is going to be very important to you but if you're trying to keep moderate frame cattle moderate size cattle mature weight is going to be the opposite it's still going to be important but what you're going to want to look at not um, selecting for a great amount of mature weight maintenance energy um, angus call it dollars en it's basically a, a, a calculation of what are we going to do when it comes back down to uh, feeding or do we have efficient cattle or dry matter intake based on what we're able to uh, put milk in the, the calf's mouth, if you will, and, and growth. Um, heifer pregnancy, and when you go to the bottom, scrotal circumference, those are both fertility indexes. Um, we want a heifer um, that's going to get pregnant um, as a yearling or a 15-month-old. Uh, scrotal circumference, again, that uh, we're going to get to that a little bit when we talk about bulls, but that comes down to the fertility of the bull. The bigger the scrotum, the bigger the testicles, the more um, uh, sperm he can produce, the more fertile he's going to be. And then mature height, again, we're if you're trying to moderate frame score or frame size, you're going to want to discount that. If you think your cattle are a little too small, then you might want to look at that and adding some frame size with that mature height. For a growth selection, again, we're going to look at carcass weight. We're going to look at fat or back fat, marbling, yield grade. Shear force is a tenderness um, that some of the breed associations use. Ribeye area is another one that, that they'll use. Again, these are all carcass traits. These are what packers are looking for. Um, and if you're a, if you're a growth um, minded producer that's not saving females, if you're a terminal cross herd that's not saving females, these are definitely things you should be looking for. You should be looking if you're selecting females or somebody's making females for you, you should be looking at the previous slide. And then this is what you're looking for when it comes to your sires to put, because you're selling pounds of calf. That's, that's what you're doing. And that, and with some of these um, criteria here with the fat marbling yield grade and so on, you're the guy that's buying your calves and feeding your calves are going to, is going to be pleased. And then he's going to come back for more, if you will. So he's that, that buyer, you may get a direct buy. You may not have to go through the auction barn anymore. Someone might come directly to you and say, I like the way your cattle feed. I want to buy them directly. So you may, you're probably going to be able to command a little bit of a premium. Plus you're going to re remove the um, commission and, and other things that, that come along with going to the auction barn. I'm not against auction barns. I'm just saying that you can put a little more of that money in your pocket. Every breed association has select selection indexes. I'm only going to deal with three, and I'm going to tell you from the get-go that Angus is what I know. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm sorry. I apologize to those of you that don't um, aren't friends with Angus, but for me, while we still use uh, crossbred, um, we do some crossbreeding. Um, here in the East, black hides bring money, and... Uh, does that, does that mean I'm a huge fan of the Angus breed? Does that mean I love black cattle? It means they pay me for black cattle, so I'm raising black cattle. And so that's what it amounts to. Um, but here's some, again, uh, Angus has dollars beef a value or dollars B. Um, it's an index expressed about, again, this is the average expected difference for future progeny when it comes to those post weaning traits and that carcass value. This is what the packer is going to see in your calves. Again, it can be very important if you've got a great relationship with your feed yard. Um, that's that if you're, or if you're feeding your own calves out and you've got an end point, you've got a, a, a buyer for carcasses, or if you're selling directly to consumers, whether it be halves, quarters, or by the cut, these can be very important values to you. Uh, dollars combined. Again, that's a, what they did was put this index together for those that want a maternal uh, calf, but they're going to be selling majority of their steers. So again, they're trying to split the difference. It's still weighted towards growth. Just know that for a fact. Um, no matter what they tell you, it's, it's weighted towards growth. Dollars M in the, in the Angus breed is, again, for those selecting for females, this is a dollar value you should look at. Again, it's going to be one that's going to be relatively important. 
again on the on the female side, not so much on the steer side, but on the female side. Uh, so that kind of gets you um, a little bit about the Angus breed. Um, Herefords, um, Herefords again uh, no, have have always been um, a range type cow. Uh, they've always done very well uh, west of the Mississippi. Uh, as as a friend of mine who raised Hereford says, that old blockhead will lay down and have a calf and get up and lick it off and just keep on walking. And uh, again, that's a they're you know you want a cow that will do that. Uh, it's always they've always given up a little bit at least in the minds of um, Angus breeders uh, in performance, uh, but I'm not sure that's the case. Um, they have come together now and there is Pole and Horned Hereford are in the same uh, registration uh, book. Uh, and I think that's done a really a world of good for both uh, gene pools. Uh, we can, they, that index, the Baldy Maternal Index is for crossbreeding Hereford bulls on Angus based cattle. Uh, you get a black baldy, as they call them a lot of times. A lot of folks that are buying females love black baldies. They really do um, make good mama cows, and and folks really do like it. And if it's a really good pure Angus, she's going to take the horns off if you don't like horns, and uh, and you'll you'll do well. She'll milk well. She'll have the hardiness. Um, and anytime you have heterosis and crossbreeding, you'll notice increased performance in, in the offspring. The certified um, Hereford beef index, again, is a terminal sire index in which Hereford bulls are used on British cross cows. Again, these are ones that are gonna be sold under that label. Um, most people know it and I didn't say it, but um, Angus has a marketing system called certified Angus beef. And if you open a sire catalog, whether it be select sires or Gen X or ST genetics or whoever, you'll see a little symbol about certified Angus beef and on certain sires. And again, they're trying to hit that same type of grid for certified Angus beef as the Hereford folks are talking about here. And then Simmental, again, uh, Simmental are very popular uh, from a terminal index uh, kind of thing. They're also popular uh, with folks that like to make some range cattle that are, have a little bigger frame, but milk well. Uh, and that's the all purpose index there you see is, um, they're bred to first, I think it's first calf heifers and mature cows. Um, so again, they're re, re, you're looking at again, maybe baldy type cattle, maybe not. Um, it will really depend. Uh, unfortunately, like most breeds, Simmental has sold out to black hides and, uh, there's a lot of black Simmentals out there now. They may still have some weight on them. They may not. Uh, limousine, uh, you, you know, you, you think of a lot of your black breeds now, they weren't black when they started. They were black um, when they came, when they came over from overseas here. Uh, you know, you can name them Limousine, Gelpy, uh, Simmental. They're, they're, they've kind of adopted that black hide again, pro from a standpoint of selling calves, I'm sure. So there is a selection index as a crossbreeds. Um, the U.S. An Meat Animal Research Center in Clay uh, Center, Nebraska has spent, I mean, they have all different breeds there. They've done a tremendous amount of research. And un I guess, again, apologizing to all the other breeds, uh, Angus is the base breed, which by which everybody's compared to, uh, but they've done a lot of, and they've, they've developed the adjustment factors uh, for, and they've been producing that adjustments factor since 1993. Um, and they've, they've done a, um, I'll show you the two, 2020 table here in just a second. So you may not be able to read that, but you can certainly put it in a Google search engine um, and figure it out. But you can see here, across the top, Angus is the breed by which everything's compared to. So if you look there, everything's zeroed across the top. Um, when you look at Hereford, the difference in, in the uh, birth weight of a Hereford is, is nine tenths of a pound over an Angus. The difference in a red Angus is 2.3. And you can see the differences um, all the way down the line. Then when it looks at weaning, you can see here the Hereford, while it was born heavier, it weans lighter. When you get down to Santa Gertrudis, 
um, born heavier, weaned heavier. Uh, again, one of the differences you might see there is the fact that Santas are certainly a breed that, that is um, set up to produce, perform in hot weather or hot areas, warm weather, uh, where an Angus with a black hide, ooh, didn't mean to do that, um, is not. Uh, and so if you look at that um, Brahma, Beefmaster, Brangus, by the way, Beefmaster, uh, Brangus, and Santa all have Brahma in them. So they all have Boss Indicus um, genetics in them as well as Boss Taurus. Uh, so you'll see that. And then it goes on down. There's a bunch of different breeds. Many of them you probably are not familiar with because they're not here in the East. Braun V, that's actually the just the beef version of the brown Swiss cow. Uh, Gelpfi is, a, is another German breed. Uh, Limousine are pretty popular. You probably have run onto them. Um, Tarnte, probably not. Solaire, probably not. Uh, Maine Anjou, you probably have. You just didn't know it because they're shorthorns. Um, shorthorn uses a lot of Maine blood or has in the past anyway. All right. So, so now we're looking at the breeding side of the equation. Um, so are your cows ready for the breeding season? Um, you know, and we're going to look at it. Body condition score, days postpartum. What's their plan of nutrition? Are they cycling regularly? And then what about your heifers? Are they ready for breeding season? Again, we're, we'll talk about body condition score here in a minute, but you should body condition score your heifers. Um, ultimately, they ought to be 55 to 65% to of their mature body weight when you're, when you're going to breed them. So if you've got a mature, if your cow herd uh, is averaging 1,200 pounds of mature uh, body weight, then your heifer should weigh between 660 and 780. Um, obviously, if your cattle are bigger than that, just do the math. They should be on a good plane of nutrition. We should still be growing. Those heifers should be gaining a pound and a half a day, uh, and they should be cycling regularly. You, when you walk out in your heifer pasture and you're looking around, you should see those heifers, um, you know, actively cycling. So when it comes to body condition scoring, and again, we could teach, we could talk a whole half an hour on body condition scoring. We're not going to do that. The beef industry, we go one to nine rating. Um, others do one to five. Um, I'm sure there's uh, even, I think they bought, bought, I know they body condition score horses and dogs and everything else, but we're going to talk about um, one to nine rating. You can see the pictures there of three, four, five, six, and seven. Um, they're kind of what I would consider in the acceptable range. Um, three is a little on the thin side. Um, four, five, and six are what I would call optimum. Um, seven's getting a little on the heavy side, but not terrible. Um, I, we definitely, in my, as you can see there in my notes, one to three, they just need a little more groceries. Actually, if, if it's one and you're doing everything right, there's something wrong with that cow. She's got hardware, she's got yonis, she's got a metabolic disorder, maybe a twist, a, a, a twisted stomach. Um, something's going on if she's a one and all your other cows are not. Um, if all your other cows are one, then you're doing something wrong. Uh, if it's a, a three, it might just be that she's a heavy milker. You need to make sure she gets a little more uh, feed to kind of bring that up uh, and then if she's four, five, or six, she's in pretty good uh, shape. Seven, again, as I said there, watch their waistline. Uh, you don't want to get them any heavier. You'd like to take a little flesh off of them, maybe. Eight and nine, um, you're going to have trouble getting them bred. If they do get bred and you don't take weight off of them, you're going to have trouble at, the, at calving. They can have problems calving, dystocia. They can have metabolic problems, ketosis. Um, other ish, other other metabolic issues, so you really need to be careful with the the ones that are a little too fleshy as well. Now, if you've got open cows and you can put a little more weight on them, they're worth more. Uh, so again, you know that's going to be a different. They're going to be our calls. We want to add to our bottom line. We're going to try to get them a little heavier, uh, but we're not going to get our breeders heavier. And and this is the same for heifers. Again. Some of your heifers may be a borderline four, uh, but again, because they're still growing. But remember, um, that's one thing you got to remember when, you, when we're talking about body condition scoring, you need to remember what phase of production we're in and what age. 
mature cows, this is exactly what we go by. If we got first calf heifers, remember that heifer is still growing. So she's growing, she's calved, she's milking. She has a lot going on. And we really wanna make sure she's in a good plane of nutrition. We wanna be providing good feed, whether it's grass or whether you're feeding her a silage or grain or whatever you're doing. We need to make sure her, her plane of nutrition is continuing to rise because she's doing a lot of work. When it comes to um, mature cows, again, we're talking about uh, cows that are should have good body condition. We're only talking about maintenance here. We're not talking about growth. Uh, we're talking about lactation. So remember, there's, there's a hierarchy of needs when it comes to nutrition. That cow's gonna maintain her body first, she's gonna milk second, and she's gonna breed back third. And that's very over, oversimplified, but that's kind of the way you wanna think about it. So days postpartum, um, the, op, the uh, minimum, I should have said not optimum, the minimum um, voluntary waiting period should be no less than 60 days. Uh, we don't wanna breed that cow back um, any quicker than that. Again, because we're trying to grow a calf in her, we're trying to make sure her body condition comes back. We're trying to make sure she's milking well. So again, uh, we wanna be careful with the voluntary waiting period. The other thing we wanna be careful of is we wanna make sure when we're walking through our herd, we should be seeing observable heats. Our cows should be cycling. If they're not cycling, then do a body condition scoring. Look at them. What's going on? Are they not um, holding their body condition? Um, we started calving uh, middle of March, and I've already seen a, some heat activity in, in a few of our early calving cows. Uh, I realize that's only a little over 30 days, but that's what I like to see. I know that she's, she's headed in the right direction. So again, the plane of nutrition, she's lactation is nutritionally demanding. This is the hot, next to that growing calf, there's nobody that demands more nutrition than a lactating cow. Uh, so you need to make sure she's getting good feed. Uh, and again, I don't care if you're feeding her on pasture, if you're supplementing pasture, if you're a dry lot calver, that's fine with me too, but you need to be giving them good quality and energy is, that's the biggest thing with folks that, that graze is that we're hardly ever, if ever, I won't say never because my, um, senior high school um, psychology teacher taught, taught me not to make sweeping statements, but uh, it's very rare that you're going to be protein deficient in grass. You're going to be energy deficient. And that's very important to remember. Energy is going to increase your uh, reproductive efficiency. So you, if you have some really hot grass and, and you want to supplement with some some sort of energy, you know, it could be uh, I mean, I wish we could get cake. The cake is really not what Marie Antoinette was talking about, but it's um, dist dry distiller's grain. Uh, you know, if you could get that out of the, the West uses a lot, the, the guys on the range use a lot of, of DDGs to uh, supplement. Again, we if we had um, uh, another byproduct feed is soybean hulls, it's very good. Um, you know, you could also supplement with corn although corn's kind of expensive today. Uh, if you have corn silage, you could certainly supplement with some corn silage. So now we're gonna talk about bulls. And before we get too far, um, there are several kinds of bulls out there. Um, some of you select sires. Uh, so you go to a, a sale or a breeder and you buy a sire. Um, some of you go to the sale barn and you buy testicles. Um, you're only worried about getting a cow pregnant. You don't know any, if you go to a sale barn, unless somebody's got a paper and they're reading it from the box, all you know for sure is that bull has testicles. That's all you know. Um, and then some of you will be using AI. And so again, you're looking at data in sire catalogs. You're looking at data from uh, breed associations. So the, I call the bull the forgotten man here a lot of times because especially in operations where people don't run the bull with their cows all the time, which I never um, recommend, is they, they put him in in breeding season, they take him out in breeding season, put him with a steer or put him a couple bulls together and they're in a pasture until it comes to the next um, 
next year and we're, we need to find him for breeding. We need a body condition score our bulls too. We need to look at that bull. Is What's his body condition score? What's he look like? Is he healthy? Is he, is he carrying good flesh? He's going to do a lot of work and probably the, especially if you're a spring caver in some of the hottest days of the year. So you need to remember that he needs to be in good condition. He has to have sound feet and legs. We want that for two reasons. One is we need to remember he's got a lot of ground to cover and he's going to be uh, putting a lot of stress on his rear legs. We need to make sure he's got a good plan of nutrition because again, he's producing sperm. We need to make sure that he's doing a good job of, of being remaining healthy. And then I rec we'll talk about the breeding soundness exam at the end of, end of the, or close to the end anyway. So again, we look at the body condition score of that bull. Um, you know, has he, is he pretty wrung out from the winter time? You know, did you put him out on a pasture somewhere and just throw some hay to him? Um, you know, what, what's he look like? Does he need some groceries? Does he need a little corn silage? Does he need a little grain? Does he need some, some of that better hay? Um, that's something that you're, you're the only one that can answer that question. Um, sound feet and legs. Again, he's going to cover a lot of ground. He's going to have a lot of stress on his hind legs. You need to think about him as an athlete. Um, he's got a lot of work to do. Depending on, you know, the average in the United States, a bull's going to cover 25 cows. Uh, some places you get on the range, even in multi-sire herds, uh, where you're running several bull with, bulls with several hundred cows, the dominant bull will probably breed. 60 to 70 percent of the cows um, they've done uh, bill ball down at virginia tech has done some work out at gardner uh, in the kansas where they're running thousands of cows and the dominant bull is is usually there's a pecking order in there and there's one guy that probably didn't breed any of them and there's one guy that breeds his lion the lion's share of them so a breeding soundness exam um, why do we do that? Because non-fertile bulls equal no pregnancies. Sub-fertile bulls equal poor pregnancy rates or stretching out our calving season. Um, everybody, you know, there's a story that was told by a friend of mine out in Nebraska. He said, I went into a, 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 a um, meeting, extension meeting, and I asked folks in the, in the crowd, and they said, uh, how many of you have a 60-day calving period, calving season? And he said, Finally, one old guy raised his hand and he says, I just don't, I do, but I just don't know what 60 days it is. Um, and in my opinion, um, and again, I know I can be harsh, but I don't find that as acceptable. You should have a calving season. And by the way, every week shouldn't be part of it. Um, you know, we calve twice a year. We have a spring calving herd, basically from the middle of March to the 1st of May, and a fall calving herd, basically from the very end of August to the middle of October. Uh, and you can control that by taking the bull out. Now, some of you will say, well, I don't know what to do with the bull. What am I gonna do with him? Well, you probably got an old call cow or you probably got a steer, put them together. You don't want him by himself because he will damage things. He gets bored. Um, the other option is find someone locally that will rent you a bull. Uh, you know, that's another possibility is there, there's ways around it, there's good ways around it, and something that you should be looking into. And why do a breeding soundness exam? It's cheap insurance. Now, I should tell you right away that a breeding soundness exam is not a guarantee of, of anything other than good sperm. Um, it doesn't take into consideration the aggressive nature of the bull, whether or not he's a breeder or whether or not he's not. It doesn't take into consideration um, his libido. It only takes into consideration, is he shooting blanks or is he shooting live rounds? Um, so that's the thing to remember. There are some minimum guidelines. The bulls should be um, done a physical examination. I'll show you a picture of that in, in, in the, um, another slide, but basically he's palpated. Um, his, his accessory sex glands are palpated. They're looking for um, infection or anything like that, abnormalities. Um, for the men in the audience, think about a prostate exam. Um, they're gonna they're gonna look at the circumference, the the testicles. There are minimum 
um, circumferences for bulls. Uh, basically for a yearling bull, it's 34 centimeters. Uh, that tells us whether or not that bull is capable of producing uh, enough sperm to um, cover the number of animals we want him to do that. And uh, then we'll take a, a, a sample. We'll look at it under the microscope and we'll, we'll look for uh, what I like to call swimmers. Um, and the morphology, you know, are there, are these uh, uh, sperm cells not just swimming, but are they normal or they abnormal? Again, something we can tell under the microscope. Um, if the bull doesn't meet these requirements, he's classified uh, as deferred, meaning um, he should either be checked again or he should be given a ride to the sale barn, uh, one of the two. Uh, sometimes it may mean he's on the young side. Sometimes it may mean uh, he has, uh, there are some bulls that were notoriously um, small scrotal bulls in the Angus breed, for instance. Again, I, I hate to always talk about Angus, but it's what I know. Um, and so sometimes the, those bulls are just later maturing and they're not as good a breeders young. Um, again, we encourage you to do the breeding soundness exam four to six weeks before breeding season. Um, this allows you enough time to uh, get another bull if you need it. The other thing to remember is it takes 61 days um, for sperm production. So if you if an injury occurs or an illness, again, you may not think about it, but um, a high fever, you know, if a bull gets sick and he, and he has a high fever, his uh, motility can go down, his sperm count can go down. And again, at that point, um, it's gonna take him 61 days to recover. Uh, again, we can have frostbite or, or cold injury. Again, something we need to think about, and it's not part of this talk, but we are gonna talk um, in December about um, winter management of bulls and cows. Again, we have to remember that uh, the bull is, is also needs care in the wintertime. We don't just kick him out and hope he does his best. Uh, we need to make sure we take care of him. Uh, and again, a, a breeding sinus exam, sometimes you hear the word BSE, not to be confused with mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy. We're talking about a breeding sinus exam. Um, it's going to be very important. Uh, you, uh, it's, it amazes me the number of people that don't do a breeding sinus exam. They'll go to a bull sale, they'll spend $5,000, $6,000 for a bull. And when they get him home, they're gonna assume that he's good. Uh, I'm not saying that the breeder didn't do a breeding sinus exam, but if you, if that was more than 61 days ago, did he get hurt on the trailer coming home? Um, did he get hurt when you put him in with his buddies and they started fighting? Um, did he get sick in transportation? Did he get a, a, a round of a fever or something? You won't know those things unless you do a breeding soundness exam. And to me, you need to protect your investment. Um, and what's the value? Well, what's an, op what's an open cow worth? versus a pregnant cow. I mean, that, that's pretty easy to figure out. Um, cow depreciation is one of the, and when I talk about cow depreciation, I mean, selling a cow before she's paid for herself. That's what cow depreciation is. One, one, it's one of the three largest costs in beef production. Feed, labor, cow depreciation, top three. Um, feed isn't cheap, uh, never was cheap, but it's certainly not cheap today. And grass isn't free. Uh, a lot of people, uh, like to believe that it that you know oh, I got plenty of pasture. Well, grass is not free. Land costs money. There's a land use fee. Um, if you're gonna if you're doing any kind of management with your land, your your interseeding clover, your fertilizing, all those are costs. Uh, and then Texas A and M did a calculation on calves on what's a calf worth, um, or what's the what's the value based on cows and at a dollar and seventy cents a pound, the increase in pregnancy earns you seven dollars and thirty-two cents per cow. When you consider, if you've got ten cows, that's seventy-three dollars and twenty cents. I just paid for your breeding soundness exam. Most of them are between sixty-five and seventy-five dollars. You've paid for it with ten cows. The rest of the cows were free, so it's a pretty cheap um, insurance policy, in my opinion. Uh, so the, the la we're going to close up here a bit. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, you need to take time and, and watch breeding activity. Um, this is going to allow you to, to catch things. 
do, do I have a bull that's not interested? Do I have a bull that's lame? Um, are my cows not cycling? Uh, you know, watch your cows and calves. Uh, and, and, you know, that's not, for me, it's therapeutic. Um, I love this time of year. I like going out in the morning and finding a new calf. I tell people I love for every morning to be like Christmas morning. I walk out and find a brand new calf on the ground. I don't want to touch them. I don't want to pull them. I don't want to do any of that. I just want to be surprised. Um, and then during breeding season, it's always nice because the calves are growing, cows are milking. Um, and it's, it's just, to me, it's very therapeutic um, to go out and, and watch cows. And, and again, you're going to see, are my cat before you put the bulls in, are my cows cycling? When you put the bulls in, are, is the bull, is the bull doing his work? Now, don't get concerned, especially during hot weather. A lot of bulls like to work the night shift because it's just too hot in the daytime, um, especially when we get into some of those hot days in June and certainly the hot days in July. Don't get overly concerned, but again, observe your bull. Is he walking? Is he limping? You know, has he, is he not putting any weight on that foot? You know, there's some things you can, uh, is his body condition score going down? Some things you can look at without actually seeing him breed a cow. So in, in summary, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So when you're thinking about genetics, think about goals. What are my goals? And then you need to think about how am I going to get there? How am I going to accomplish these goals? I want you to plan to succeed. I don't want you to fail to plan. And lastly, you can't measure what, or you can't manage what you don't measure. If there, if you're going to buy yourself one thing, your operation, one thing this year, if you don't have one, it should be a scale. I'm hoping you already have a handling chute. If you don't get a handling chute, then get a scale. I don't want anybody getting hurt. But every, every cow calf producer, should have a set of scales. There's no way you you can look, you can all day long, you can look at cattle. And I guarantee you, you're going to be wrong as many times as you're right when you tell, when you guess how, how much they weigh. Um, you need to have a set of scales. Um, evaluate whether your cows are ready for breeding. You know, walk out there. If you're going to, if you're going to turn the bulls in on June 1st, you better be walking out there from May 15th on or, or even earlier. Are my cows looking good? Are they ready to go? What's their body condition score? How they are they? How about them? Are they walking? Are they laying? Uh, needs and things like that. Test your bulls. Do a breeding soundness exam. Hopefully, you've gotten a veterinarian that can do that. If not, there are folks around that will travel. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be cheap if they got to travel a good distance, but there are folks around that do breeding soundness exams. Um, and in some cases, you can always take them, uh, haul them somewhere. North American breeders in Berryville. Uh, let me say them real quick. There's another. There's several places around to collect bulls. Um, Triple Hill Sires in Smithsburg, Maryland. Um, they can do. They can also do breeding soundness exams if if necessary. If you don't have a veterinarian that can do it, um, you need to make the needed adjustments when you find a problem. You need to react to it and you need to fix it. And then, like I said, sit back and watch and relax. It's a, it's a, I love being in the cow calf business. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, ranching for profit. We did a seminar with them last fall, and and dollars and cents wise, there's probably more money at the end of the day in uh, running stalkers. Um, I can tell you right now, if I couldn't calve cows out, I wouldn't be in the beef business. Um, it's, there's more than, at the end of the day, there's more than just dollars and cents that gets people out of bed in the morning. And uh, for me, it's, uh, it's watching um, those cows um, have those calves that I've mated and, and are they better than, than their mothers and, and so on. Um, at this point in time, I'm happy to take questions. Um, so let's see.